When Martin Hugh invited us to participate in his podcast, we quickly figured that the best way to make him understand our process in this studio was to have him experience it for himself, before talking about our art or the technology that is integral to our process. So we did a few 360 shots with him to warm us up. Suddenly, we're here recording with you. We just spent an hour shooting in 360 with you. And the question I ask you during the shooting is, I hope it's the first time you do this. Yes, this is a uh, very unusual setting for me, especially for recording a podcast, really outside of my comfort zone. Uh, but, you know, speaking about comfort zone, this is your comfort zone. You have, what, like 176 76 cameras pointing at us right now. How did you both get into everything that's photography, videography, and all that? Mm. Yeah, I, I used to code. I'm a programmer. Okay? Okay. But I wanted to be a photographer. You know, I, it looks fun to be a photographer. <laughs> so um, I bought a camera, started to do a few gigs, and I realized that, no, it's not that cool <laughs> after all. <laughs> so um, I kind of stopped, but then I, I had this super cool project. Uh, I got hired to, uh, to code a multi-camera system, so similar like, like this, 24 four cameras, I think, back in the days. And it was 12 years ago, actually. Wow. So I did the whole system in three weeks, uh, talking to cameras, uh, grabbing files. And it was the beginning of something. So it's just the, the mix of programming and photography. And then I felt like I was into something with, with this. Uh, I really I got hooked to, to do multi-camera photography. Mm -hmm. But what I was doing at the beginning was just live events. So I was doing delegates at uh, football games, just making people shoot for brands. So it was okay. brand activations. That's fun, but I wanted more. More so creativity, like, more input. Yeah. So and, and we had this super small studio upstairs and we set up uh, 24 cameras. And my goal was to do a, an art project, something beautiful with multiple cameras, because that, that was not usual. Uh, even as of today, like we don't see that uh, very often, but that's uh, this is the first time I'm I'm seeing this setup. By the way, yeah, <laughs> it's really crazy. So yeah, walk us through how um, eventually you both connected and how you're also. I know you're very involved in the in everything that uh, he's creating as well, Kim. So can you tell tell us a little bit about that? We first collaborated together, I think, ten years ago. Yeah, a bit more. Yeah, 2013. Um, Eric was doing his first personal project in 360. He was looking for dancers because he was doing something very technical, mixing time lapse, stop motion, and light painting. Way too complicated. Yeah, it was super complex. So he needed uh, professional dancers. And he contacted me. We didn't know each other. And back then, interestingly enough, like I'm a movement artist, I'm a dancer, I'm a former athlete. And during that specific period, I was actually um, recovering from a surgery, so I could not uh, dance per se. So I was um, kind of interested in more subtle ways to dance. So this approach to um, movement as stillness actually was very fascinating. Like we explored for an hour and then didn't talk for a year. But it was a very powerful experience for, I, th I think, well, for me and for both of us. So you wanted more after that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So basically, a year later, we decided after like that specific project of his uh, toured um, the festivals, like the, the film festivals, and it got a... Um, a really nice success, actually. Yeah, and, and she was she was the face of the project, actually. Uh, so I was carrying her face uh, with me, uh, traveling in, in film festivals. So yeah, a year later, we decided to experiment again and to see how our um, personal experiences, like life experiences, would kind of be 
carried in uh, this art, let's say, mm -hmm. and we never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> was it, was it, um, sorry to interrupt by the way, but was it something that took a bit of time for people to understand or actually like accept like this kind of, because you have a very unique style. Um, w tell us a bit more about that. Like, because I know a lot of people want to start in photography. They want to, you know, perhaps they see themselves b building a, a very particular style or brand, but sometimes it can be hard to stick to something when, you know, you're the first person to be doing it. Mm -hmm. So what's your, your couple of words or tips on that? Yeah, well, it, it's very simple. I see so many photographers do it all and it becomes a mess and it's great when you start. This is what I was doing too. But at some point when you find something that kind of excites you more than the rest, just stick to it. Just pile on it. Just become better at that thing. I could have stopped after, after that first project. I could have stopped because I did it. Mm. Why continue? I mean, uh, I could have experimented with so many other things, but that because I continued, um, we did so many projects with this and it became sort of our signature. Mm -hmm. But it were, there was more to it because we did it once with the 360. But once, once we started to do light painting outdoors, that became way, way bigger. And yeah. that took us a while to figure that thing out. So we do uh, light painting in 360 indoors in studio, but we do it outdoors with single camera at the beach or the forest in in the nature. Actually. That was your actually your first uh, NFT collection, right? Exactly, yeah. To tell us a bit more about that. You wanted to talk about NFTs. Yes, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> you know why we're here. <laughs> um, yeah, because I find that uh, collection fascinating. It's called Night... Uh, night Reflection. Night, exactly. Walk us through that because I've seen so many of these pictures that were taken over a period of time and they're all in different environments, some tougher than others, especially I see you that like you're barely wearing like, you know, just I think a dress or something and it's in, in, winter, in winter, snow yeah. around. Well, the, the truth is that winter is easier than working here uh, during summer with the bugs. Yeah. <laughs> True. With the mosquitoes is, is the worst. Uh, winter is not that bad. It's hard, but we can manage like she can manage 20 minutes. I can do 10 only, <laughs> even if I'm wearing a coat. She's strong. I, I'm not. But to answer your, your question about the night reflection, um, back in the, uh, the early days of NFTs in uh, 2021, um, I was uh, doing this kind of work like uh, for already like nine years, I think. And people were telling me on Instagram, oh, you have to uh, look into NFTs. Uh, you, you'll be a perfect fit. And my answer was always the same. No, no, I'm busy. I'm doing TikToks. <laughs> I was so <laughs> busy on TikTok back then because it was the hype for me. Like I was having fun over there. And yeah. I was like, no, I cannot start something else in this. Um, so it took me a bit too long. But finally, um, we got into NFTs uh, through Sloika. We launched our first uh, collection of uh, nine images uh, back in September 2021. And we kept launching more and more up to uh, 12, uh, 12 series of nine images, 108 images total. So that's a collection of, uh, of, our, of our work outdoors, uh, actually. You wanted to talk about the future, right? I heard you in your head. <laughs> I, heard, I heard what's... Yeah, cause <laughs> I was about to say this is an ongoing collection because for us, it's, um, it's a, our body of work of mm. what we do as long exposure photography um, outdoors in landscapes. But... It's a long-term project, an ongoing project, and we're we're still creating actually in order to keep evolving this uh, this collection per se. NFTs kind of allowed us to take a step back because we were creating a lot and we've been creating a lot, mainly f like with the social media speed, I'll say, like approach. So it gave us the opportunity to kind of look at our whole body of work and to see how we could craft it in chapters, collection, themes. Um, and that's how we create now. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we plan for uh, travels and locations, and so we're thinking, we're having that in mind, like what is the next chapter for, for this um, for yeah, this body of work. I love that because it's actually how I felt about 
art and how NFTs really transformed that, that industry as well. Just because of the fact that like, I never found myself being like really like an art collector per se before NFTs, just because it was so, I mean, unless you've made the commitment to buy some sort of, you know, work of art and hang in your, in your home, like you weren't necessarily just collect something out of the blue. There was a lot more friction. Now with NFTs, there's this, you know, there's collections you can, you can just, you know, buy something at a click and then that's in your wallet. You and talk like a Moonbird collector. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to uh, Kevin and Justin, the, the art collectors, uh, PFP. But coming back to um, what you were saying earlier, which is that I feel like now we're so much more okay with the fact that it can be a work in progress. You know, mm. like collections can be an, a work in progress. And social media actually forced us to be not only focusing on the quality of things, but also the quantity of how we're communicating that process. Uh, tell, tell us a bit more about like how, you know, those early days of TikTok. I know we're bouncing back and forth, but I yeah, but that's perfect because it's all part of the same story. So mm -hmm. TikTok was about showing the process mostly. Mm. People are mu much more interested about learning. We've been teaching this technique for, for so long and TikTok was the perfect uh, platform for us. We show how we do things. And yeah. then we show the end result. And it's That's it's great. so much more complicated than people think. Like to, to teach something in a short format like that, condensed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you look at a good video and it goes viral, like you think, oh my god, I could have made that. It's only 15 seconds or something. Mm -hmm. But there's actually so much much thought that goes into there. Mm -hmm. But what we did for TikTok is actually very useful for NFTs because for each piece that we release, we also have the behind the scenes. We have a short video. We have some uh, some images that show the, the location because every time we go outdoors to shoot, we also film the, the process. So we, we have that footage and we use it for, for NFT. So we have a website for like, for each piece. We, we talk about the process. So Kim is good at writing stories and uh, I extract frames from the, the videos or I post some, some videos that shows the, the process, how we created those images. And that adds a bit of authenticity too, because it's real and it's not uh, generated, you know? Mm -hmm. I love what, um, I think actually Gary Vee talks a lot about this. He says like, you know, try to make every piece of content, try to break it down into like 50 pieces of content, 100 pieces of content. That's why it's so important to just have that extra camera that's just filming the whole process mm -hmm. as well, then you can just chop it up into many different pieces. Yeah, so now it looks complicated here with 176 cameras, but in the field, even if I have only three, everything goes so fast that it's more uh, dynamic. When we work outdoors, like it was, it was quiet here, like working uh, with you earlier, it was peaceful. It's mm. not, not the case. Outdoors, most of the time, we have to rush because we shoot during the blue hour. We just have a few minutes. I have three cameras to manage film the process, take pictures from two angles, so. Right, because like the, the moment the light changes a bit, you have to tweak all your settings. Yeah, right? and if we work in the sand dunes, I'm not going <laughs> back and forth from the camera to Kim. I have to make a big loop so I don't leave any footprints on the sand. Oh, right. It's fun. Oh <laughs> That's my God. how I keep in shape. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for the people that don't know exactly what light painting is, and also uh, you call this bullet time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can you just yeah. explain that a little bit to us? Yeah, so we do mostly two things, by time and light painting. Sometimes we mix both like we, we did today. So by time is the act of having a lot of cameras side by side, triggering everything at the same time or with a small delay so we can add some animation. So we what we do here is the mostly the software. So we code everything that makes the, all these cameras talk to, to each other and crunch the files, give you a, a fast preview like the one, the one we ju you just mm -hmm. saw. Light painting is long exposure photography. We do two seconds exposure. And during that two seconds, I paint with light. Mm. But I'm not using any other sources of light. So I'm not flashing my subject. So I try to paint like I have a beautiful trace of light, but also have a beautiful light on the skin. Right. So you remember when I was starting the exposure, it was close to you. The light was super close to you. That was the, the moment where I was exposing your face. Mm. So, but at time and light painting, it's the mix of those two techniques. So I shoot long exposure in 360. Wow. And, and you as the subject in, in a lot of these works, like how, like how have you developed that communication to each other? Because I feel like now it can be yeah, so intuitive, talk. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just know what to do. Yeah. I like to say that uh, Eric actually dances with the light because we're both 
performing like let's say like he's not uh, behind the camera he's with me uh, in the field in front of the camera I guess we do it a lot we've been practicing a lot and it kind of becomes I'm a dancer so I kind of I see rhythm I feel his rhythm he's also a, like a musician so he's giving me the countdown and we kind of work mainly in silence mm. but um, with a, a rhythm that we both feel so we can connect to the same experience that we're creating if that makes sense yeah it does and and usually like so for example what we just did we did a still pose right but there are times where you're moving as well as the subject so that makes for like more i guess like images that uh, convey movement right exactly so we either get movement by the fact that we have a lot of cameras so going from one camera to the other but on top of that we can add the delay between each camera and then if she moves you'll see the the, the movement that she's doing in 360 and we use that mostly with um, long exposure where she's going to stay still a little bit and then she starts moving so she becomes kind of a, a ghost okay? mm. and so mixing all of these techniques super fun and when you when your brain starts to think in 360 you're like <laughs> it's it's crazy there are so many things to explore because yeah, we have access to this this is our, our stuff so uh, my brain keeps thinking about other ways to to leverage this uh, this technology for art mm -hmm. yeah jumping back outdoors um, because when we shoot uh, during the blue hour and during the nighttime the the experience is very different for me as a the the subject or the performer because I will have to stay mainly on, on the same spot in a similar pose for a very long time be before let's say we change once the we start it can take up to one hour before we change spot or something like mm -hmm. that so it's a very um, we have a very different experience on the field because he's running um, kind of uh, it's it's a, a rush or um, so he's very stimulated oh, and fight the mosquitoes here. oh yeah yeah <laughs> but most of the time i'm still for a long period of time and it becomes almost a challenge but not a physical one but uh a mental one yeah yeah because you know if you stop moving it doesn't take long bef before like your mind starts to oh, of course you know the hamster kind of runs around so it's an experience of almost meditation mm -hmm. and discipline while we shoot so I get in a very different state than Eric. So it's super interesting because it's opposite but complementary. Okay. And have you guys had like stories of a shoot that took extremely long because you, you, you become, because you know, like, you know this as a creator, like both of you, sometimes you're just, you're seeking that shot, that perfect shot. You know where it's at, but you can't really get it right, right away. And then you, you can just go on that rabbit hole. But do you have stories like that? Well, yeah. yeah, and she doesn't see the picture, <laughs> so she doesn't know. And, and like in my head, I'm like, okay, I, w I really want this one, and things are moving now. So let's say we're shooting with the Milky Way. It's not moving fast, but it is moving. So if I have my perfect alignment, I have to hurry, and sometimes then that means that I will have to move the camera a little bit just to fine-tune until I, I really get it. So, so yeah, sometimes it can take long. And if it's warm outdoors, uh, we can shoot for like six okay. hours straight. Uh, but I'm I'm thinking about the 3.10 yeah. specifically. Like we have an edition uh, that is, it's exactly that. It was at the end of the night. We've been shooting for probably six, seven hours already. And so, and now Herrick, he, he has like this, not vision, but uh, he see the potential of a specific shot. So we spent probably an hour more to get, to get this single image. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah. So at the end of a, I don't know probably eight hours of shooting but once we're in the process we love we love the experience of being outdoors and and mm -hmm. creating as much as you know the end result so all of this is just an excuse to play outdoors that's it <laughs> <laughs> you both you both strike me as very um uh well exactly outdoors and like it seems like you're moving a lot can you tell us a bit more about your lifestyle and how you stay in shape because you're a performer you're also a performer i saw you dance around me with all those lights i was like wow he's doing that like all day 
Can you tell us a bit more about that? Because I know you mentioned to me when you came to our restaurant that you only do one meal a day. I'd love to elaborate on that. Yeah, but what's good about doing one meal a day is cheating, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always I say, stop talking. I, <laughs> I always say that like um, I'm so bad with self-control over like little periods of time, but I can cr control myself for like 20 hours, right? But the moment I have my meal, I can eat whatever I want. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I feel like it's, we have, a, we have an approach that is not rigid in anything. So we, we try to be as uh, flexible and adaptable in, in many aspects of our life. We often say that um, light painting is a lifestyle or the art we create is a lifestyle. There's, I would say there's, there's no distinction between the two. Mm. So we train uh, every day. We have like movement, different movement practice, either training or yoga or uh, you know, hiking or there, there's a long list of things that we, we do um, and we mix them. We're trying to be very conscious about our sleep, uh, mm -hmm. what we eat, and we take breaks. We work hard, but for us, it's important to have kind of a, a balance mm -hmm. every day if we can. That's when we are in Montreal, because when we're outdoors for a long period of time, let's say we go on a trip for 30, 60 days to shoot. We shoot every day yeah. or almost. So that's a different rhythm also. Do you want to comment? But, but we're still going to do yoga pretty much every day when we're traveling. Uh, we have our sequence that we can do uh, standing if uh, we're not in <laughs> good conditions. Like we, we do yoga at the airport. Uh, Amazing. And it's just a way for us to, uh, yeah, to stay, uh, stay healthy, stay in shape. Uh, do you do you have um, specific times of the day where you feel more creative? Because I know like some creatives, like let's say writers, they like to write at night or, you know, like is, d does that apply to you guys or you can, you just freestyle it and you can do it whenever? Indoors doesn't really matter, but outdoors we, we have to adapt to the conditions and we shoot mostly during the blue hour. So these days in Montreal, that would be at 9 p.m. Mm. But in winter, it would be more like 4.30. So. When we create outdoors, we have to adapt to the light. But we prefer to shoot after sunset more than before sunrise, let's say, mm -hmm. for a sleep schedule. But if we have to, we do it. You know, like going out at 3 a.m. and uh, to do like a moonset and then to wait for the blue hour of, of the sunrise. Um, so once again, we try to be as adaptable and flexible to the conditions that we want to be able to meet. Right. Instead of making sure that we have the circumstances that are ideal for what we prefer to do. Because I'm a, I, I prefer to go to sleep early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when we shoot at night, we often shoot until 1 a.m. at least. Or we go back outdoors at 1 a.m. because we... Oh, we wow, yeah. Like we're going to adapt with like let's say at 1 a.m the milky way is straight and we know there's a great alignment with a pile of rocks and we just put the alarm clock at one and we just go back and, and shoot but you're shooting a lot of these you know shots like really like deep in nature and all that stuff like do you ever like do your dances and then there's just just a wolf next to you or like an animal a wolf <laughs> <laughs> crocodiles <laughs> Yeah, we we have we have foxes many times. Uh, we had crocodiles, but we didn't see them. We but we could hear like strange noises. We got oh very my God. scared. Um, but uh, things are not as dangerous as what they look like. I, I don't know, or, or maybe we've been lucky. Never saw any snakes. Uh, we saw scorpions many times. But well, it's because you have a lightsaber. Nobody wants to come near you. <laughs> maybe <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> After the interview, we met Martin in his element, his new restaurant, The Garden Room. We were curious to learn more about him and everything he does, and wanted to eat delicious food. He told us that his strong interest in art led him to study graphic design and to eventually pick up a camera. As he was shooting food in restaurants and bars for his portfolio, he also developed an interest in marketing, thanks to Gary Vee. 
that led him to open a creative and media agency, Mars Media, as he wanted to help restaurant owners use social media as a marketing tool. As he did so, he fell in love with the industry of hospitality and invested in his first restaurant in 2019. On top of that, he's also invested in different Web3 projects such as vFriends and Proof Collective, as well as developing the first NFT members club in Montreal called Maya Club. Now, let's go back to the interview. You've worked with big brands like, you know, Apple, uh, Microsoft, uh, also um, Adobe, mm -hmm. right? What's one thing that surprised you from working in collaboration with these brands? Hmm. I don't have an answer for this. <laughs> Or at least if I can rephrase the question, like what's, what's one thing that you've learned through the process of creating with them that perhaps like you had a, a certain conception and then it just... You know. Oh yeah, sometimes it's not what you what you want, but it's part of the game and uh, I'm okay with it, but I can turn that around and the reason why we do these, uh, these gigs with brands is because we do personal projects. And the more I, I do personal projects, the more I get gigs with brands. And that's very fun. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. And that was my plan, actually, at the beginning. When I started doing this, this thing in 360 with light painting, my plan was to go viral. How do you plan that? Mm. It's ridiculous. But I was like, I think that if uh, my project gets seen by enough people, some agencies, some brands are going to see that and then we'll be paid to do what we love. Mm -hmm. And that worked. And it's been working for over 10 years now. But, uh, you know, you have to put a lot of time for your personal project until you get, you get noticed. And, and once that works, like, it's very fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you, uh, I mean, because it's so, it's so interesting for the people that are listening. Like, uh, we'll put some links in the show notes to, for, for them to see your work. But, like, we've seen those, those images, like, in so many different places just because they're so unique, right? Like, and I know that it's specifically your style. But it's, what's interesting is that, Prior to NFTs, I didn't get to know about, you know, you guys just because I guess like I was just focused on on building a business and creating and all that stuff. But how has that changed, I guess, your relationship with your fans as well when you think about NFTs and the community that it's built? Because I, I feel like that's a big step from the Web 2 social media world where people are were mostly participants to now where people can be owners and supporters of your art. How do you see that? That now is such a small fraction of the people we interact with. That now, that is a web tree, mm -hmm. is so small compared to what we call the web two. True, true. Um, so we really have to take care of the, those people that are like on, on Instagram, on Facebook, because we've been teaching to them. That's how we, we built uh, a, a bigger community. That's because we teach what we do. We show the process. Right. And most of these people are not into uh, NFTs or, or Web3. So we have to, to balance uh, those two things. Uh, so it doesn't merge well at the moment. We'll see in the future. Do you have an opinion on the, that? Because uh, you, no, you've no, been through like, that like also. Uh, I, I really, I agree with what you're saying because like there's so many Um, so much friction to get someone mm -hmm. to be comfortable with everything that is Web3. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, well, how do I set up a MetaMask wallet? How do I, how do I get ETH? Like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's still, you know, you s tell someone about that and in their mind, it's still, well, it's super volatile. Like what happens with this? And if I buy your art, like, is it going to be, is it going to triple in price tomorrow? You know, um, but yeah, I, I totally get you. And, and what I liked about what you guys did is that you, you already built a fan base before, getting into web3 yeah but it's totally separate maybe yeah. two or three people uh, are into the two communities but uh, now it's very different people that web3 is mostly on twitter for us at least mm -hmm. and the rest is totally different but um, i enjoy a lot still uh, showing the process um, using uh, instagram and we don't know where instagram is going to go in the, the next years also uh, mm. they did some tests with nfts didn't work but i'm sure they're, they're still working on the, on the future mm -hmm. Kim, you had some thoughts that you wanted to uh, chime in with. Yeah, it's interesting to see how education has been a big part of our community, like of how we interact with people in Web2. 
And with Web3, we had to have another perspective because people were not necessarily interested in learning the technique per se. Mm. As Eric said, the reasons why people are there and are interested to you as an artist or to your art is are not the same, which is great mm. because then we also um, approach our art more in a um, like exposition galleries, like th starting to think about all these other possibilities that we didn't consider before because w our energy was invested somewhere else, mainly mm -hmm. in teaching and sharing and building our um, our business, basically. So I, I find it very stimulating that they are actually kind of, they feel like two separate worlds, mm -hmm. but who knows in the future how they can merge or at least um, interact with each other because as you said it's also about education edu educating mm -hmm. these people to something else so right you were about yeah to i want to hear your point of view on that maybe you know the future uh <laughs> no i don't i don't <laughs> i wish i knew but i feel like inside this setting i have superpowers just like uh, <laughs> we might just teleport in time or something <laughs> um but yeah I, i guess like my point on it is just like No, nothing's going to stop technology, mm -hmm. but, you know, adoption will come, but how fast, we don't know. And a lot of these, like, cycles we've went through with crypto are the same cycles we went through, you know, during the dot-com boom, like, in 2000. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's the new thing for me because I got to experience it, but at the same time, I was listening to knowledge from people that went through these, uh, you know, bull markets and bear markets. So, I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm just doing my best to stay educated in this sphere. And one of the things that is really top of mind right now for me, I don't know if you guys dabble in that, but like AI, if we can touch on that a little, a little minute. I don't know if you're, you've been experiencing with like MidJourney or ChatGPT, all that stuff. Yeah, it's very useful, especially ChatGPT for us because uh, we can craft uh, very professional text, uh, legal text or just... Uh, Uh, sentences that we uh, improve, uh, uh, especially the fact that we're not English-speaking people. So it's uh, it's great to have a like kind of someone teaching us how to write properly because it's better than an autocorrector. Like it really rephrases for you. So it's 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 kind All of right. great. Um, I don't use Midjourney. I know what it is, but uh, I use the equivalent in Photoshop. That is the uh, generative field. It's really good. So one way I've been using that recently is that. Uh, most of my images are horizontal, and if I want to post a, a TikTok, sometimes I don't have enough uh, information up and down, uh -huh. so um, I can create a vertical equivalent of my images. It's very subtle, okay? You, you won't really notice that, but it's just like, it feels a bit better than, than showing an horizontal picture in a vertical frame. Really? It's kind of filling the, the empty space up and down. But it, it it's that, AI. that really works? Like it's... Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's surprising. Because, because I'm just thinking about horizontal picture. There's a lot of things to fill at the top and bottom. It recreates the reflection. If uh, let's say the uh, the reflection is not complete at the bottom of the frame, it generates a perfect perfect reflection at the bottom. It, it's wow. scary. It's so scary. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did yeah. you did you uh, start to experiment with Midjourney? Yeah, mostly mostly Midjourney I've been using just because like I'm I've been doing mostly food and photography beverage uh, beverage like photography, mm -hmm. but I've always been curious about how we can make custom graphics for clients of ours that are restaurants, hotels, bars and clubs. Like we're we're trying to, you know, instead of creating graphic from scratch, you can just you know, put a prompt in mid-journey and if you do it well, it can generate a flyer for you. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a special promotion for a Sunday brunch and you want a picture of like a, or a graphic of mimosas cheering, you can literally prompt that and it will do something that's, it's obviously like, it's not accurate a hundred percent, but it can generate so quickly that within like five minutes, you have something potent mm -hmm. that you can develop on. So take that, okay, take your end result from your journey, bring it to Photoshop. So let's say you, you want to change a little part of it, just do a selection mm -hmm. and type your um, your prompt, like change uh, a pepperoni pizza to uh, like a sausage pizza. Really? Like this, and it's going to change it uh, right away. What is that called? Adobe what? 
Photoshop. It's just it's, a, it's Photoshop. Okay, yeah, so yeah. AI is within Photoshop now. How is. come I never knew this? <laughs> You're not on TikTok. <laughs> My Maybe feed is I all should, about I this. I should follow your channel. <laughs> no, no, I don't talk about uh, these things uh, on TikTok, but I, I learn about that uh, mostly because I follow uh, Photoshop's and Premiere uh, accounts, so I, I always see the newest versions. So I I, mm. I know and. Um, yeah, it's great because it's integrated inside the tools that you use to use, uh, mostly Photoshop for me. And it's really the fact that you can select an area and ask for something, and it's going to blend with, with what's around. It's crazy. I keep using it for my cat, actually. So I would put some pictures of my cat with cinnamon rolls, vegetables, and Chicken. chickens. Okay. There, <laughs> there, and there. <laughs> <laughs> and w w your cat is just like in nature or something? or. No, just at home. Just at home, and then yeah. it's just... <laughs> and you can do it whatever you want around it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild, especially what they're doing with, like, voice right now with AI. So I'm actually experimenting with this for the podcast. Yeah, same, same. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, like, uh, basically replicating your voice so that you can just do text-to-speech, right? That's not how I use it. Oh, okay. So I'm using uh, Murph these days, and it's... It's not meant for that, but what I do is that um, I write my text from my voiceover for my videos, and then I just ask for like to generate the MP3, and I listen to it because my English is so poor, and I try to improve it, and then I can hear the subtle differences what they say because mm -hmm. they say my text, they say it in a perfect way. Wow, that's so I crazy. don't use the final voice because um, it's. It's not me, and I don't know, it doesn't feel uh, very legit if I use the voice of someone else uh, on, on top of my videos, but it's a good learning tool for me. Mm -hmm. How are you using it? Did you record your voice and then it can... Uh, yeah, exactly. So now I'm, I'm trying to train that AI to uh, catch up on like the sub subtleties of my voice and my tone. Mm. So that, for example, with this podcast, I'm going to try to record the intro just by typing it in. Yeah, yeah. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to generate an audio file and then i can just put it at the beginning of the podcast like you know hey welcome to another episode of the show like today our guest is eric and mm -hmm. you know here. do you feel like the technology is there like uh, is it good enough uh, to uh use it? yeah surprisingly like it's just how much data you feed it uh, but there's good solutions out there mm -hmm. um can't remember on top of my mind but i've, I've used uh descript mm -hmm. that's one yeah. that's uh pretty pretty decent well, uh, most of all, like, I'm, I'm just curious about how that's all going to evolve. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, it's pretty scary at the same time, but, yeah. you know. These are great tools. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel like, um, as you said, like, we approach, we're the same. We approach things with a lot of curiosity in life. So it's important to know about these things and to uh, experiment with the tools. But for us, it's not... I don't see the day where we will want to replace the experience of crafting the light, of being in the sure. field, of yeah. dancing, you know, like all these things that are actually in the experiential part of life with mm. AI. But it's super interesting to see how these tools can help us during the process. Well, it's just going to augment whatever we're doing. Like, exactly. you know, it's like when people, that's what's funny to me, like when people maybe speak badly about uh, AI artist and I'm like you know that's what people said about photography when the camera first came out it's like mm -hmm. oh you're you're the lazy painter that didn't want to paint or <laughs> something like that like it's crazy how quickly we can get accustomed to these things and I'm I'm just uh, I'm hopeful with where NFTs are going as well that we're going to see a bit more democratization of artists that can enter the space and actually make it as well like mm. it's it's a good combination with social media to give outreach but then with nfts to provide a supporting base for these artists that are starting out like because i you know I, I don't know how old you are but i remember when i was a young kid i'm uh, i'm 29 now like the idea of being a graphic artist or whatnot was back then was so far-fetched Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you know, you can make money online with your art. Mm -hmm. is, is that something that, I don't know, for you, was it at a certain point it clicked and it was like, oh my God, like I can, I can do, make a career out of this. I'm curious about like your thoughts. Like, was that, was that like an aha moment or you're just like, I'm going to do this no matter what? You know, I was a programmer. I was making things. Now I'm an artist. I'm making things. It's not that different. It's just that as a programmer, I had to stay still for 10 hours 
to make something okay and it wasn't very healthy now so this the hard time doing now is uh, about going outdoors with a camera walking long distances it's just more uh, viable in the long term but um I just keep creating stuff so that's this is art i guess but it's not that different for me from what i've been doing since i was a kid just making my own things i never wanted to have a real job i was not good at that i wanted to do my projects and at first it was with programming now it's with photography and and light painting and all of this stuff but um i'm not answering the question <laughs> <laughs> for me i don't know if it was like a aha moment i remember seeing a, a dance show and having the naive thought of i can do that i think i could do that mm -hmm. because of how i felt um like the experience i had like seeing that show and from then um when i went to school they they told us are you sure you want to commit to that journey because it's a really hard one but i feel like it's just a matter of doing it every day i think i just never stopped committing to that mm -hmm. artistic journey and it's cyclic it cycles and ups and downs yeah sometimes you lose your motivation like as f long as i renew the the reason why i do it i know i can go through like those hard patches if that makes sense and does that reason change sometimes yeah I think everything changes. Right. Everything is uh, like in transformation and yeah, I guess it changes. Yeah, because sometimes, evolves. yeah, sometimes I feel, you know, as a artist or creator, like you might be motivated by something that's a bit more selfish mm. initially. Like maybe you want to make something beautiful so people can recognize your work whenever they see it. Uh, maybe you, you like to be on stage because you like the thrill of having people look at what your performance and at the end being like wow that was amazing you know but then eventually like it just becomes a selfless act that you do just for the fun of it yeah that cannot last for very long i think yeah it's you like can, the initial, it cannot fuel yeah. you for a whole career mm. with transformations and adaptation and um growth mm -hmm. yeah yeah um You're a moonbird holder, and that probably changed the way you look at art, right? Um, Because you're more surrounded by collect collectors. Like I would say, it's really the proof collective initially. Like which oh, is oh yeah the yeah put that in the same basket, but you're exactly. right. Exactly, the proof collective. Like yeah. the proof collective of a thousand holders. I guess mm -hmm. that's really the initial step into the door that allowed me to learn about all things NFT. Not only the art collecting side of it, but also the I guess the capabilities of an NFT, like in my mind at first, like it was all about the art. Then eventually it's like, okay, art with a hint of utility. And maybe in the future, it's going to be a lot of utility. Yeah, right? but I know you mostly be, uh, because you collect PFPs, but do you collect art too? Yes, uh, yeah, okay, mostly okay. on, uh, I mean, Tezo, some, I, I love to be on there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and then educate us because we don't know about Tezo. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's very indie. Like it, yeah. it still feels very like clunky in a sense but i love it it, it feels yeah. it feels like underground like okay. <laughs> uh but it's just you could you could browse for hours on there and just find stuff that are is absolutely amazing and buy it for you know a couple of bucks like okay. that's that's what i like as well mm -hmm. and that's what i've been training myself to do but i also like i collect on uh more like traditional like eth blockchain or whatnot yeah Mm -hmm. didn't get into bitcoin yet but that <laughs> yeah yeah same same uh because when bitcoin ordinals started to pop uh we were already uh too busy on on, on something else but um yeah we have to look uh into that at some point uh like the bitcoin nfts the uh Tezos ones we collect mostly on uh, ethereum uh mm -hmm. collect work from our friends <laughs> our artists uh, that, that we've been following for a while Well, Eric Kim, I, I want to be wary of your time as well. Like it's been almost close to an hour we've been recording. I just wanted to say thank you again for, uh, you know, bringing me to this amazing studio, getting me to experience like what it's like to be the subject of a bullet time <laughs> uh, production like this. And um, I, I also wanted to take some time to acknowledge what you're doing because, you know, as a photographer and videographer, whenever I see people that have such a unique 
brand and unique style and they stick to it you know it gives me a lot of hope for being able to like forge a name for yourself without just being i guess a, a jack of all trades because it's so easy in photography to be like hey i have a camera let me do some weddings let me do some some of this or some of that but then sometimes you can just like zone into uh, one niche and actually make that your living and your your career and you're so too busy say, you're too busy to go there <laughs> with your <laughs> restaurants and everything <laughs> but i mean it's all connected it's hospitality yeah, yeah so at the end of the day like i i create the environment the space where i'm going to be taking photos and videos so yeah that's, that's that's very good yeah well thank you again and um until next time thanks martin <laughs> It's always inspiring to learn how others' journey unfolded and what led them to where they are today. Martin seems to read what he does with curiosity and mindfulness, following his various interests and finding ways to create connections between them. And as you can imagine, that resonates a lot with us. 